So welcome to Atmosphere, where we debate and discuss the potentially disruptive force of cloud computing. We really want you to ask your questions of the presenters and of the panels as we go through the event today. We've deliberately built time in so that over, over the breaks, during lunch, uh, and in the evening, you can carry on the discussion and debate with us and with other people in the room. So I have a question. Why have so many bright and high-powered people turned up today? Is it because of the amazing lineup of speakers? Authors and academics, including Nicholas Carr, Carsten Sorensen, and Jeffrey Moore. Pioneers in the cloud computing space, including Mark Benioff from Salesforce and Werner Vogels from Amazon. CIOs who've embraced the cloud and are here to share their experiences and to talk about how collaboration is changing the way in which we work. Is it because Google's gonna share its vision of cloud computing and take the lid off some of our product and our product re development roadmap? Or is it because we've got a tasting of Chateau Latour later this evening? <laughs> I can see by the smiles over there why this gentleman has come. Whatever the reason is, I hope you have a great day today. Many of us in this room are digital immigrants. I know that I am. My young children remind me of it every day. I took my son to school the other morning, unfortunately not something that happens very often given the pressures of work. Uh, and a lady came up to me at the school gates and said, ooh, we do find your puppy delightful. To be honest, I had no idea who she was or what she was talking about. Turns out our sons were communicating on Facebook and my son had uploaded a picture of our new Labradoodle. And yes, Labradoodles <laughs> do, do exist. <laughs> my son's life, social life, takes place on Facebook just as much as it does in the playground. For him, these aren't separate activities. The lines between the internet and the real world have disappeared for him. Children today are communicating in very, very different ways. For them, technology is not new and exciting. So we're here today to talk about cloud computing. Three weeks ago, there was a conference in London on, on cloud, uh, and some senior IT execs suggested that widespread adoption of cloud computing is not gonna happen for another 10 years. At the same time, the IDC are forecasting that the size of the cloud market is going to expand, is going to treble in size to over 44 billion by 2013. Who's going to be proven right? Our CEO, Eric Schmidt, who can't make it today because he's been delivering the keynote address at the Gartner event in Orlando, has said that the widespread adoption of cloud computing is not a question of if, but of when. And I look forward to discussing with you later on this evening whether you agree or not. In the meantime, ask those questions, join in the debate, and give us your honest feedback. If it works today, we'll do it again. And so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the man who previously headed up our EMEA business across all products and really understands our markets well who knows about scaling businesses, who grew the team in EMEA from 1,000 to over 3,000 in four years, and is now President, Global Sales Operations and Business Development, Mr. Nikesh Arora. Good morning, everybody. Uh, a warm welcome from me to all of you as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the good news of going first in any event is Everything I say is going to be fresh and new. You'll hear it for the first time. But if it's too early, you can wait, because during the day, hopefully, most speakers will repeat the same message. So I think at the end of the day, Dave Girard will come and wrap everything up. And hopefully, he will conclude with similar messages for all of you. I think what's fascinating to me is all of us collectively, at this point, are at a tremendous inflection point as it relates to technology and technological revolutions. Now, um, and it's very hard when you are in the midst of one 
to step back and see what's unfolding in front of you. And it's, it's easy to sort of share, it's easy to think about. Um, I've just moved two months ago to California. I've lived in London for the last 10 years before that. And I'd moved to London 10 years ago from Boston. And I moved, I had bought three new VCRs at that time. I put them in my house, I brought them over here, not knowing what I know now is that you cannot make them work, right? <laughs> no, there's lots of the people I can tell, that's pretty stupid of me to do, but that was 10 years ago. I was stupid then, so now I'm smarter. So first thing I do is I plug a VCR in, and you know what happens, little fireworks happen and you no longer have a VCR, right? <laughs> so anyway, so I went to this wonderful gentleman who's not far from here um, to try and help me buy a new VCR. So he said, VCR is like done, you should get a DVD player. So I said, fine, I'll get a DVD player. So I replaced my three VCRs with three DVD players. And I went to my local primetime video or place to get my, DVD, my DVDs. And they had this huge rack of videotapes and this small rack in a corner of DVDs. And all you could get there were classics. Because somehow the movie business has figured out the classics will stay forever. Who knows whether DVDs will stay or not, <laughs> right? So all the new stuff was on tapes and classics were on DVDs. I don't have to tell you what's happened in the last 10 years. I, I, I don't know where my VCR is. I think I just moved and my wife had this box of videotapes. And he said, and said, darling, what are we gonna do with these? And she's like, no, we've gotta find a way of getting them onto DVDs. And it's a simple story, you know, it is a very simple story and we all say it's very obvious. We all say, okay, tell us something new. But it is very hard 10 years ago if you go back and say, how many, of us in a, how, how many of us had anticipated that? How many of us had predicted when that change is going to happen? And how many of us had actually taken action, other than me, because of blowing up ECRs, uh, in anticipation? <laughs> and it's all about getting the timing right. And I actually believe we are at a point where we are at an inflection point where all these forces are beginning to come together, and these are going to make a big difference over the next five to 10 years. All of you look young enough that this transition is going to happen during our lifetimes. And if you, think, if you step back and think what's going on, you know, there's 1.8 billion people around the world connected to the web, right? And some of the cynics among say, well, that's still one-fifth of the world or some such number. You still have roughly three-quarters of the world or four-fifths of the world to cover. Actually, if you look at it differently, it is over 95% of the world's GDP. Right? Anybody who can afford anything is connected to the web. Right? And that 95% is actually, you know, it's the first time you can actually target the entire GDP of the world with one piece of innovation or one thing that you do. So all these people are connected. And sort of, you know, this, this, the interesting thing about inflection points is that things go from nice to have to must have instantly. So I used to work in the mobile phone industry. And about 10 years ago, if you were in a room with an audience like this, you asked the question, how many people have a mobile phone? And you get about three quarters of people raise their hands, right? Now the question is how many of you have two mobile phones on you right now, right? And your mobile phone is something which is a must have. If you lose your wallet, you're more likely to wait to get back to your office or your home or your, tell your secretary to cancel my three cards and I need some cash. If you lose your mobile phone, you feel like you've lost a part of your life. Right? That's where we are. Now play the same thing forward. You know, the next thing that's happening is, the next must have has become broadband. Right? How many of us have broadband at home? The answer is, I won't ask the question. I'm presuming the answer is every one of us. And most likely, if the broadband is home and not working, our kids are going to remind us at least 10 or 15 times a day, if not our spouses, right? So it doesn't matter what kind of CIO you are and which organization's entire IT infrastructure relies on you to keep the, keep the trains running on time. It is that phone call from home which has dread. It's like, darling, I don't know how to get this broadband thing to work. Right? I actually did that two weeks ago. We moved to California. I have Comcast, and I couldn't figure it out. And my wife calls me and says, this broadband thing is not working. My life is at a standstill, right? You remember this used to be like, I'll go check my email at work when I'm there. I don't have to bother with my email. I got my first email ID in 1996 when I used to work in the financial services industry. And I had one at work, but because we worked in the financial services industry, our CIO decided it would be too dangerous to allow us to send emails outside of work. You guys are laughing. You remember those days? It was too dangerous to send emails outside of my work. So I had to get an AOL connection at home and I got my email. The only problem was most of my friends had a similar problem. They weren't allowed to send emails outside of work. So I'd have to like log into my AOL account, 
use my narrowband connection, and then try and find a way of asking my friends. I used to have to tell them earlier, hey, can you send me an email in five minutes, and I'll log in to check if my email's working. Because you didn't have mobile phones then. You remember those days? What will happen now if email shut down, people will stand outside the outside, you know, like people stand outside when lights go off and email's not working, they're out in smoke and say, shit, I can't work. My email's down. Right? That's what we've come to. That's where the transition has happened. So, you know, there is ubiquity of broadband. I walk around, I carry my laptop everywhere. I expect to have broadband connectivity where I am. That ubiquity is not is not something that existed many years ago. That ubiquity is not something we took for granted. If you look at the, the progress that has happened in stories, the progress that has happened in computing, it has changed the world. You remember those days when you had IBM mainframes and those little terminals? And all the intelligence was in the cloud, i.e. the IBM cloud, right? Then we went to the whole big client server business. I'm, I'm older than I look. I've been through all those. I've even, pun I've even programmed on punch cards. Right? So, and now we're back to the world where we're going back to the cloud. But we believe all the things are in place which are going to drive this thing to happen. And you know, <clears throat> three weeks ago, I was trying to make a flight between LaGuardia and Toronto, and I had 25 minutes to spare. From the point the lady said, yes, you can make your flight at the check-in check counter and to get to the gate. So I was running. And as you know today, you know, every, every person who is non-threatening has to take off everything that they have on them, my shoes, my belt, my laptop, my you know, shabby 100 milliliter bottles of <coughs> things. So I did that, and then this voice yelled from me at the back, sir, you haven't shown me your boarding card, and if you don't, I almost felt like he's gonna shoot me, right? So I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I take out my boarding card, turn around and give the guy my boarding card, and I turn around, and I grab my bags and I run to the gate. And guess what happened? I forgot my laptop at that place. Now that usually that used to send shivers down the spine of my CIO in my last company. Like all things, all lights would flash and things would happen and you know, it'd be very bad. There'd be company information on there. I got to Toronto an hour and a half later. I had sent an email from my Blackberry after I realized when I got on the plane that I forgot my laptop. My assistant was calling the Guardian trying to find my laptop. They didn't find it. But when I landed in Toronto, all, that, all they did was a tech guy gave me a new laptop, a loner one, and my life was back to normal. I have so much information on my laptop, so much. The only thing that they needed to do was to turn off the AT&T SIM card in my data card in my laptop. That was it. Everything else is in the cloud. Now, that's interesting, and I think that's where we have to go. I mean, as CIOs, having been in that business before, the cost of maintaining that infrastructure which allows you to have stuff on your laptop, do all sorts of things, is going to sort of you know, cause us, if nothing else, if not technology, that's going to cause us to move. What's interesting is, if you go back and look at the history of technology, all the innovation that happened in technology actually happened for enterprises, for businesses in the past. If you look at the reason, the laptops, the, all the software innovation, et cetera. This is the first time in this inflection point, actually, we're behind. The innovation is happening at the consumer. Right? The consumers are using Facebook. The consumers are using Twitter. The consumers are watching video on YouTube. The consumer search is actually better than enterprise search in most companies right now. And it's actually consumers who are now demanding co companies to start coming up the technology curve. My 10-year-old, I mean, Adrian talked about his child. My 12-year-old will go to a brand, interact with it, and say, Dad, these guys don't get technology. Right? And her, her interpretation of not getting technology is if a site cannot offer her chat to chat with somebody on customer service. Her interpretation of technology is that those guys don't have a Facebook update or they're not tweeting. And that's, that's what's going to happen. Our kids are going to define whether we're, how fast we're moving up the technology curve. Never before has this happened. Enterprises always led the innovation curve. For the first time, consumers are leading the innovation curve, and they're going to test us on how quickly we adapt to this technology or not. Right? If you're not tweeting, if you're not on Facebook, if you're not providing video help, if you're not providing online chat, you are not as cool and up the technology curve anymore. And it's going to go from a nice to have to a must have in the next few years. And how are we going to go up that infrastructure? How are we going to go up that curve? Depends on people like yourself. Look, I think the cloud provides tremendous opportunity. I think it provides tremendous challenge. 
on one hand, you have to balance innovation with reliability. And traditionally, having been in the CIO business, reliability has been a challenge. You know, you've tried to balance innovation and reliability instead of say, do I really want this thing to go down and get that phone call at midnight from my boss saying, this shit's not working, get it to work. You don't, so we go towards the risk-averse way. But this new cloud is going to require us to think, where do I strike that balance? Because we are going to go through a transition. It is going to cause us to decide between regulation and being borderless. The cloud of the internet is designed without borders. Regulation from the past was designed with borders. So we're trying to take a new world and fit it back to the old world. So anyway, I'm hoping that during the day, many of the speakers will come talk about these things. Hopefully, you guys will all collectively figure it out. I'm personally delighted that all of you have decided to join us this morning and during the day. I'm looking forward to the conclusions of the big discussions that are going to happen today during the course of the day and the conclusions you will reach. All I can say is on behalf of Google, my colleagues in the audience, uh, our head of engineering is here, who you will hear from later in the day. Dave Girard, who runs our global enterprise business, is here. Nelson Matos, who's there from Google's EMEA product and engineering world. We're all here to listen, but we're all here also to tell you one thing. This is going to be big. The enterprise space is going to be big. Cloud is going to be big. We're here. We're committed to invest. We're going to invest with you. We want to, we want to take this journey together with you. And hopefully, this room can end up being the pioneers who actually make this cloud revolution happen. With that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.